Hey, my name's Fernando, and I'm a technical marketing manager here at GitLab. Today we're going to go over the newest features in GitLab 13.5. Hello, I'm Cesar Saavedra. I'm a technical marketing manager at GitLab. In this segment, I'm going to be covering a new feature in GitLab 13.5 called Feature Flags Flexible Rollout Strategy. This new feature uh, or capability enables uh, the feature of, for a percentage uh, of page views uh, with configurable consistency of behavior. It leverages uh, an open source project called Unleash uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to implement this activation strategy uh, called Flexible Rollout. You can configure the consistency to be based on user IDs, session IDs, uh, random and available ID. And the rollout percentage could be anywhere from zero to 100%. What does it matter? Uh, to customers uh, and prospects, uh, it enables them to define the stickiness based on session ID, user ID, or a random, which is uh, no stickiness. And this gives them more control over the rollout and allows them to support stickiness for anonymous users. They're also able to experiment uh, with variations of their applications in production. And also uh, they can leverage this feature to uh, segment uh, their users and to do A-B testing. To learn more, here's uh, some resources. Uh, there's a, a link to the documentation, a link to the issue um, that uh, implemented uh, or that address the implementation of this uh, capability, and some things to follow. Uh, you know, you can check out the, uh, our progressive delivery information uh, in our um, CD category direction, and the link is right there. So let's jump into the demo. Here I have a project called the Spring MVC JPA in which I have implemented a feature flag. And the feature flag is right here. It's called FF1. And let's look into it. Into it. This uh, feature flag has two strategies. Uh, it has one for staging. For staging, it will offer the feature just for a user ID called Mickey at Disney.com. And for the production environment, it will do a percent rollout of 50% based on available ID. Available ID, the way it works is if the user is logged in, it'll make the behavior consistent based on that and the user ID. If the user is anonymous, it'll uh, make the behavior consistent based on the session ID. And if there's no user ID or session ID, uh, the feature is enabled for the selected percentage of page views uh, randomly. So in this case, it's 50%. Uh, and this, uh, the specific feature consists of a list of products that we'll, we'll see in a second, uh, that they, they may be ordered by ID or by name. And the feature actually orders them by name, not by product ID. So let's go to the environments and let's do, we can do production first. And here's the sign in. So let's sign in, let's sign in as Pluto first. And as you can see here, uh, the products are ordered by name, which is the feature. So Pluto got the feature. So that's one user. I'm going to try with four users. So let's try with the second user, which is uh, who is Magic. And Magic also got the feature. As you can see, the products are ordered by name. So that's two out of four. Let's try with Mickey. Mickey did not get the feature. As you can see, the products are ordered by product ID, not in alphabetical order by name. And the last one is Hulk. And Hulk is, uh, did not get the feature. So that's two out of two, so that's 50%. And uh, in production, that was the strategy. So let's go to staging. And in staging, let's try the same user IDs. And the other strategy that was the 
that Mickey was gonna be the only one getting the feature. So Pluto did not get the feature. Magic did not get the feature. Mickey got the feature right there. He was tar specifically targeted. And Hulk should not get the feature. Yeah, so Hulk uh, did get the feature. So in order to enable uh, feature flags, uh, you need to do a few things uh, within your project. Uh, the first thing you need to do is uh, define some variables. And here the variables you need to define are the unleash instance ID and the unleash uh, URL. If we reveal the values, you will see these values here. And these values you get from the feature flex, uh, flex configuration settings. Uh, so if we uh, exit this one, let's just go here. Here, if you click on the configure button, these are the values that you see in the variables right there. Okay, so you just copy and paste those to the variables. And then the next thing you need to do is you need to update your source code to use these variables and, and the feature flag. So let's go to, I believe it's this one here. There we go. So please ignore the debugging statements that I left in there. But basically in this, um, in this class, I have a, um, I'm instantiating a configuration for a leash here, and I'm passing the uh, instance ID and the URL that came through via these environment variables, as well as the GitLab environment variable, which in our case is going to be either production or staging. And then the next thing you need to do is wherever you want to uh, enable this feature, you need to have this if statement. If the feature is enabled and you pass the feature flag name, in this case, if the feature is enabled, the product list is ordered. Else, if it's not enabled, the product list is just ordered by product ID. Very good. So that concludes uh, this segment. Uh, thank you very much. In this segment, I'm going to cover a capability introduced in GitLab 13.5 called View Cluster Cost Management Data in GitLab. So this new capability allows you to see an overview of your cluster costs and resource usage in the GitLab user interface. Uh, our integration builds on top of the KubeCost cost model open source project and gives you uh, flexible insights into various levels uh, of your clusters. Uh, before this capability, many users had to create their own scripts to better understand their cluster costs. Why does it matter? For customers and prospects, uh, now as they're a part of their cluster cost management, uh, customers can now get insights into their cluster resource uh, usage. They can also identify unusual high peaks uh, in, in cost. Uh, they can save money by identifying idle clusters and either decommissioning them or consolidating workloads into underutilized clusters. And finally, this insight can help them plan and forecast for future quarters and years uh, cloud consumption budgets. Here are some resources to learn more about this new capability. There's the documentation link. There's also a link to the issue. Uh, there's a link to the open source KubeCost uh, cost model project. There's also a link to our ad adaptation of that KubeCost uh, cost model project and a link to examples of cost queries that you can use uh, when querying the data uh, related to the cost, uh, cloud cost. Uh, things to follow, check out our cluster cost optimization category uh, uh, direction page. The link is right there. And other notes, uh, you, uh, in order to be able to use this capability, you need to be a maintainer of the group or project. And also you need to have uh, organization level billing permissions in your cloud provider account, whether using uh, GCP, or um, Amazon or Azure. 
Okay, now let's move on to the demo. I have created a group called Cube Cost, and I'm gonna go ahead and create two projects inside of that group. The first one is called Cube Cost Cost Model. I'm gonna make it public. I'm gonna create it. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to clone the uh, our adaptation of the Cube Cost uh, Cost Model open source project onto my local directory so that I can then uh, import it into the project, the empty project that I just created. I'm gonna go into the uh, clone project. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the .git directory and I'm gonna go ahead and copy these instructions to push an existing folder into this project that I just created. Very good, so once I've pushed uh, that project, uh, I refresh the page and you can see the contents of the project now have been uploaded to GitLab. I'm gonna go back to the group. I have the populated project already there, cube cost, cost model. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a group level uh, Kubernetes uh, GKE cluster. I'm gonna give it the name C Saavedra dash cube cost, provide the project, the zone and the number of nodes. Um, I'm gonna change the zone to US East 1D and I'm gonna leave three number of nodes and the machine type is gonna be N1 standard two. Actually, no, I'm gonna change that to E2 standard two. I'm gonna go ahead and create the cl cluster. And once it's created, I'm gonna go ahead and start um, install some applications. There it is, the cluster's uh, started on GKE. And I'm gonna start, uh, install, I'm sorry, uh, Ingress, Assert Manager and Prometheus. Prometheus is uh, an open source monitoring system that is, uh, we're gonna be leveraging it uh, for this cube cost uh, integration. Very good, now they are all installed. Next, I'm going to make sure that I am connected to the uh, right context uh, and the cluster. So I get the credentials and make sure that the context is right. I'm gonna create a namespace called cost model in my GKE. And then when I'm gonna uh, run a, a kube uh, CTL command uh, using the uh, YAML files in that Kubernetes subdirectory, which will um, basically instantiate the pod in the running clusters right there, cost model, and that's the name of the pod. And it's up and running already. And also Prometheus is up and running on GKE. I'm gonna go ahead now and create a second uh, project under this group cube cost. And I'm going to um, call it um, Spring Java. Make sure it's public. It's gonna be an empty project uh, like before. Uh, I already have this project in my local directory and I'm gonna be pushing it to this empty project I just created in, uh, in GitLab. So I'm gonna change directory to that uh, project on my local drive. I'm gonna make sure that all the files are there and then I'm gonna copy and paste the commands uh, to push the existing folder into this empty project. Let's refresh the screen and now we should see that this project is no longer empty. There you go. So that's the Java sample, sample project that uh, we're going to be deploying to GKE. So we're going to turn on auto DevOps. 
let's just uh, click on the continuous deployment to production. And this will start a pipeline that will compile, that will build, uh, run a bunch of tests and deploy the application to production. Very good, so now that the pipeline is finished, let's go to operations metrics. And um, we want to open now the dashboard for the uh, cube cost, which is default cost YAML. And there you go. This is the uh, chart showing us or a graph showing us the amount of uh, the monthly note costs for GKE in this case. And as you can see, we made a, we pushed something to production where you see that rocket. We applied a change to that environment and we can change uh, the range to 30 minutes if you want. And that also gives you the monthly cost, uh, a minimum, a maximum and an average. Just to make sure, let's uh, open the running environment the application, I'm sorry, and uh, it's up and running. And this is the YAML for the dashboard that you just saw for cube cost. So that's all uh, I had for this segment. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Hello, Bye. my name is Itzigan Barour, Technical Marketing Manager. And today I will speak about Group Wikis. Wiki is a separate system documentation that uh, you can access it from each project via this link here in the left side for wiki uh, and you create uh, you can create uh, pages via the web interface via this button or or locally using uh, git until 13.5 wiki was uh, limited for projects and then in, and since 13.5 it is available also on the group level why does it matter? As a GitLab user, I want an easy way to document my work and also access and consume my team and project documentation. And why does group uh, wiki matters? As a GitLab user, I want my wiki to be on the group level pages so that my whole organization can access the wiki. And why it's uh, important for us, group wiki was the most uh, requested feature. It got something like 654 uh, votes. And when we make our customers and users happy, this matters for us. Uh, resources, the issue and the docs. A and now let's see how it works. So this is my group and I will open a wiki. And this is the, my home page. And on the right side, there is a, a navigation to different uh, folders and pages in my wiki website. So, uh, for example, I have here uh, marketing and uh, TMM, and under each folder I have all another folders or pages, and I will create a new uh, event under the marketing. For that, I will create the full path. They must uh, give uh, in any description. And create page. And I have here an AWS reInvent. I can go here and edit the description and the title. And I can delete the page. And for each page, I can see the page history, which changes it has. The next item I want to show you today is trigger downstream or a child pipeline with the manual jobs. So uh, what it is, uh, parent-child pipeline or cross-project pipeline is not uh, new, but it wasn't possible to trigger manual jobs. Manual jobs means that the pipeline stops and wait for a manual uh, action in order that the job will start. Why does it matter? Customers will have the flexibility to use when, uh, with, manu when with a manual condition, for, even for trigger jobs. Before it was limited for when with on success, on failure, and always, but for some reason it wasn't uh, possible for manual. And uh, for us, we are uh, fixing some limitation or bug, and, and now we are not limiting uh, 
when to specific uh, cases. And we allow when with all options like we do have with other uh, jobs. So uh, let's see how it works. Okay, so we will open the CI-CD configuration file, our YAML file. I have two trigger jobs. And in the second one, I added the, the keyword when manual. So if I will start the pipeline, you can see that the one job, the iOS job, trigger the child pipeline, but the Android waits for my uh, manual action. When I click it, it will trigger the child pipeline. And of course, you can uh, click here and see the actual pipeline. So now you can trigger manual jobs also for cross-project pipeline and parent-child pipeline. This is the end of my demo for today. Hope it was useful for you and enjoy the rest of your day. Hi, I'm Ty Davis with Technical Marketing. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about Epic Swim Lanes that's been released in 12.5, something that is uh, very big and helpful uh, for those that are using uh, GitLab for Agile or Agile Portfolio Management. So what are Epic Swim Lanes? Um, you know, straightforward here, Swim Lanes, um, when you add them to uh, the GitLab issue board, it's going to go ahead and group issues. Uh, according to uh, an epic, and that's going to help us uh, track high priority, high priority epics, see related issues, or track forward progress by that grouping mechanism that is now part of GitLab. We can see here, if you're on your board view, you go up to the top right corner, it's group by, and you can put group by epic. And what that's going to do, it's now going to organize all those issues that are part of your board uh, on that epic board. Uh, or sorry, as part of those um, swim lanes that are organized by epics. And why does this matter? Um, because this is something that is uh, essential for uh, agile project management, for agile portfolio management, uh, for customers and prospects. Um, it's just that base need to group work um, based on epics. So you have that portfolio management piece. You can have leadership that has visibility into where certain epics are in terms of uh, issue progress. And it's giving that that uh, view at a portfolio level that we have not had yet for GitLab. There is current document, or there's not direct documentation on swim lanes in docs yet. That is coming very, very soon. Um, there's still documentation on epics. And this resource here around uh, the epic is you can go view um, the epic for uh, swim lanes and see what kind of progress is going to be continually made in the future with swim lanes and what's been released right now and add any kind of feedback you may have on the current state of swim lanes. We'd love to hear that feedback and know what you'd like to see in GitLab uh, as we continually work uh, on the MVCs for swim lanes. Now, real quick, I'm going to hop out here and I will just show you live what you basically saw on the screenshot. So. Uh, you know, I have here uh, my board view. Um, up here is the group by. This is where I can come group that by an epic. And then now I have um, these different epics that have grouped my issues. And I can um, reduce those. I can open those up. And I can uh, go about uh, organizing or looking at uh, different swim lanes based on uh, the epic I want to focus on most. If you have any questions, please feel reach out and thank you for this time. Hi, my name is Fernando and I'm a technical marketing manager here at GitLab. Today I'm going to go over some of the new features in the 13.5 release. So the first feature I'm going to go over is customizing SAS and secret detection rules. And what this does is it allows you to modify your existing SAST rules as well as modify your existing secret uh, detection rules and be able to remove some of those rules from, from actually being used in the scans. So why is this important? Well, this is important because it allows better customization of your SAS scanner and secret detection scanner to go ahead and run custom rule sets, um, make the, the current rules 
you know, more custom to your organization's needs. Same thing, for example, like um, for secret detection, instead of maybe there's weird types of formats for secrets that you use that you put within, that you can put within code. And we want to detect those. We want to add more instead of just scanning for a password or passwd or the default ones. We want to add more. And now I'm going to show you that in a demo. Um, one thing to note that right now is that this is available in the SaaS for Node.js and GoLang. And these customizations can be provided uh, by editing a Tomo file. And now, yeah, let me jump into this demo. So I've created this project um, called Tiny Micro. It's just a simple uh, Go microservice. Um, and I'm gonna show you how this works. So I have a .gitlab uh, folder with the SAS rule set.toml. And what this is doing is um, it's setting a custom rule set for Golang and it's gonna, um, uh, for GoSec. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna use this um, file as the custom rule set file. So you can see that we're going to use the GoSec config.json to customize the GoSec scanner. And what I do here is I go to the GoSec config and I created this, which checks for certain patterns or certain strings. And I added the weird pattern. So uh, the default one looked exactly like this. Uh, without the weird. So now I added a pattern to detect anything that has weird in it as a possible hard coded secret vulnerability. And I went ahead and changed the entropy and you can read all about this within GoSec. But um, so now looking at my main.go, you can see that I just print, I just have a variable named weird and I'm just printing that out. And if I go to the security dashboard to see the vulnerabilities detected within the master branch, which that's in, you can see a vulnerability for potentially hard coded credentials. And there you're going to see um, that there's a potentially hard coded credential. I go to location, which is in main.go um, 26, and you can see it points to my um, weird variable. So that's one thing um, I wanted to note. Now, um, and that this makes it very, very useful for um, just expanding these rule sets and adding different things and different configurations. The rules are of course different in the Node.js. It just depends on the scanner, what you can customize. And you can see that within the documentation. So now to jump on to the next feature. So SaaS support for iOS and Android mobile applications. So this feature adds uh, SaaS uh, scanners for iOS and uh, Android mobile apps. So now you can scan the static source code of these mobile applications. So um, one benefit of this is that a lots of companies have, you know, code written for backend and infrastructure, and then they also have, they might have a mobile app to access that infrastructure or that backend uh, service. And you wanna make sure that your native application is also secure. So we are expanding our portfolio to enable that. And um, this, this was, um, the, this integration was actually contributed by the HEB team. And uh, HEB is a grocery chain uh, within Texas and parts of Mexico. So their digital team actually contributed back this integration. And we were just wanted to highlight that and highlight that um, really at GitLab, anyone can contribute. Uh, we, have, we have lots of documentation on how to, how to integrate different scanners within GitLab. And that's something I'd like you know, everyone to go ahead and check out. There's also a demo project, which um, I don't know how maintained it is at the moment. I'm planning on making my own project on this and then sharing it uh, with y'all um, within the next update. But what I want to show is currently in this project, I'm looking at an MR 
And within this MR, you can see that there were vulnerabilities resolved that were in master before. And we can see that it detected um, insecure web view implementation and that the web view ignores um, the SSL certificate error. So this is known as a, a high severity error. And you can go ahead and see that this works exactly how it works with um, all the different vulnerability scanners. Uh, it's the same format. It's just done for the uh, mobile platforms. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. To see more cool GitLab content, be sure to subscribe.